I am Dan, good to be with you guys today. Uh, we get to look at 2 Timothy, and before we do that, I want to share two things, well actually one, uh, about myself. One at the beginning, one at the end. Um, I'm a little worried that you might, you might hate me for the first one, and you might judge me for the second one, but they're both good sermon illustrations, so I'm going to go for it, okay? So the first one is we have a, a little saying in our house, in the Hudson household, <clears throat> that's why we go to the gym. It's a little quote. We say it all the time, multiple times a week. It's an 18-inch decal on my wall, actually, at home. Uh, Because it represents a real value for us as a family. Whenever we have to get through a physical task, whenever we're in an airplane, you got to put the thing in the overhead, you know what I mean? That's why we go to the gym. you got to carry groceries home or lift a delivery, you know, upstairs, uh, move furniture, get a tough pickle jar. That's why we go to the gym, right? It's really important for... Uh, our family to be enabled and strong enough to handle just normal life things. And I, I totally do understand that sicknesses and injuries and conditions can limit people. And so this proverb, please know this little Hudson proverb is not trying to look down on anybody or be judgy or, or critical or anything like that. It's just a fun saying that conveys a priority uh, for us to be strong enough for basic functions, to be ready to help people, to be prepared Uh, to physically get through the little challenges that come our way. I don't even go to the gym, by the way. (laughs) Still have all my, like, COVID gear in my kitchen at home, so that's that's the gym for us. But you get the point. Like, we work out there. We just want to be empowered to endure through the everyday stuff. And that's really the force of Paul's letter to Timothy. In 2 Timothy 1... Paul, last week we saw, Paul was just talking about former ministry partners who were not strong enough for this. They were not able to endure the challenges of first century mission work, and they quit. They abandoned Paul and his commitment to preach the gospel and to establish local Christian communities. They bailed on him. And now he looks to Timothy in chapter 2 saying, that's why we go to the gym, right? I want you to be enabled by God to get through the difficulties of following Jesus and building up his church. That's his message. Be empowered by grace to endure for the gospel and stay faithful for the salvation of the saints. Be empowered to endure, faithful for salvation. We're going to see that all throughout the passage today, that it's all about empowerment and endurance for Jesus. And Paul makes that point in a bunch of different ways, through metaphors of soldier, farmer, athlete, uh, through his own suffering as an example of endurance, and through this theological poetry, which we'll see at the end of the passage, that anchors our endurance to God. It connects our our commitment to God's consistent character. And in the first two verses, Paul wants Timothy especially to know the way that you're going to last, the thing that is going to help you keep going. It's not something that you can pull out of your pocket. It's not like you dig deep and just find it within your, your heart. You can do it kind of thing. Your own efforts to get the work of the gospel done. It's a, he wants us to see that Christians are empowered to endure by the grace of of Jesus. Let's look at that in verse 1. If you've got your Bibles open, please do follow along. If not, that's okay. You can follow on the screen. Let's read verse 1 together. It says, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Two things here. That term, be strengthened, in Greek is endunamo. Endunamo is the super literal translation of that would be like empowered, enabled, strengthened. It's a passive verb, too, that means you're not making yourself stronger. Somebody else from the outside is doing this to you, for you. You're not able to just become more capable by your own effort. It is God who is the one that strengthens you and enables you. Be strengthened. And second, in this verse, there's this double preposition phrase saying, by the, the grace that is in Christ Jesus, conveying this beautiful picture that Timothy has been brought into a location, a domain, a, a sphere, a space of God's grace by his powerful work of Jesus at the cross, his sacrifice, his forgiveness, his victory over sin and Satan and death into his generosity and his love and his goodness. And he's saying, come into that place and be empowered, be enabled, be strengthened by that. By the grace that is exclusively in Christ Jesus and in no one else. The location and the instrument. The where and the how we are empowered 
It's like the water that we wash in and the water that we drink, outside and in. Have you ever taken a tea bath? I haven't, I've asked this three times now, nobody raised any hands on that. I've taken a tea bath. It's kind of nice, okay? You boil a bunch of tea and you soak in it and it kind of, it's a way to like get some caffeine too. It, it, it kind of conditions your skin. Yeah, okay. <laughs> You can drink tea, I'm sure we've all done that. You can also soak in it. In both ways, you're getting the caffeine of the tea, you're getting some benefits. A hyperbaric oxygen chamber, kind of a similar thing. We all need to breathe oxygen, uh, but also being in, that, in that, that pressurized tube can help you heal from injuries in certain conditions, inside and out. It's a place we go to for strengthening, and it's also something that has been poured in us. We're strengthened by. Does it make sense? I think that's how the grace of Christ works in this passage. That's great. It's a beautiful idea, but still a little abstract maybe. So how can we actually practically be strengthened by grace? And what does that mean in like concrete terms? Let me define grace so that we're all talking about the same thing. Grace is getting a good thing when we deserve a bad thing. And that's what happened at the cross when Jesus died for us. When he was raised to life and forgave our sins. And instead of us getting the penalty of death that we all deserve, God gives us new and everlasting life. He pours into us his Holy Spirit, his very presence to live in us who trust and believe in him. We don't deserve that, any of it. We deserve the opposite. And so that is incredible, tremendous grace. And anything that's a product, an effect, an extension, a fruit of that, Anything good in our lives that we receive because of that work of Jesus is grace, yeah? And that's what empowers us to follow and to serve the Lord. Let me give you a few specific examples of this. One would be spiritual gifts, obviously. These are specific abilities uh, poured out and powered by God so that we can help build up the church. We can love, lead, serve, sacrifice, heal, teach all for the glory of God. That's empowerment by his grace. Another one, sometimes God just moves our hearts. Maybe we're not in the right position. He can shift us back into it. Moving us by the sacrifice of Jesus that is so beautiful and compelling. It stirs us so deeply and affects us over and over and over all throughout our our Christian lives. It just takes our breath away. And we have those moments where it just melts us again and again to tears. And it just pushes aside any frustrations or fleshly impulses or selfishness and distractions that are, that are pulling us away from serving the Lord effectively and faithfully. It resets us by his grace to be uh, positioned, powered, moved for ministry. God can do that by his strengthening, empowering grace. We experience this. When God gives boldness, let's say you're in the parking lot, you've just come back for, from lunch with a coworker, and the conversation is starting to go in a spiritual direction. I'm excited about this, but maybe I'm not totally sure what to say. And then all of a sudden, you're communicating the gospel in exactly the way that that person needs to hear it and understand it. The great questions are coming to mind, and scripture and godly wisdom is right there on the tip of your tongue. That is God's grace emboldening you for evangelism in that moment. We experience this too when he helps us power through pain. There's a sister in this church just so godly and mature. I respect her so much. She deals with multiple chronic illnesses. This discomfort that would deflate and discourage me, I'm sure many of us, but she walks with so much love and joy and kindness and readiness to bless other people in a way that doesn't even make sense humanly, but it's possible because she is so in Christ Jesus, just swimming, bathing in his grace that enables her to power through that pain. God's grace could do that. God's grace empowers us, strengthens us when our work is weak. I love this. I need this a lot. It's probably happening right now. But when when our kids crew lesson or our life group meeting doesn't uh, go exactly the way we had hoped, but the next day you hear from that family like, That meant so much to me. That really illuminated this new aspect of the gospel. I needed that. Thank you. I didn't didn't see that. I thought it was terrible. But God used our weak work and made something great and strong out of it. You You know the TV show Chopped? I love it. Food Network kind of thing. I feel like that's us sometimes. We just bring them this basket of like weird ingredients. Make something out of this. And God, God creates this masterpiece. Feeds people with it. Well, all we had to bring was like a lemon. You know what I mean? 
God can do that. He can strengthen the church even through our weird ingredients and our weak work. We experience this strengthening grace when we want to give in to social or political pressure. Like our lives would be so much easier, wouldn't they, if we compromised our values and our priorities to just match uh, what our dear, beloved, unbelieving neighbors hold. If we gave in to the popular sex ethic of the day or uh, the gender framework that's held by so many right now, we would have fewer people angry with us, judging us. We would be so much more comfortable if we just thought the same things as our science teacher, if we voted the same way as our coworkers. But God gives us grace to endure through that discomfort and to stay faithful to him with clear Christian conviction and to communicate too in those discussions with compassion and respect, ways that glorify him and help people to follow him. We could spend all day on the numerous ways that God's grace can strengthen us in Christ Jesus, but we'll just leave it there for now. And, and I, so I hope with just this quick overview of, of God's strengthening grace, you can sense that you're not lacking in your walk with Jesus. You're not empty. You're not alone. We're, we're actually not under-resourced. We have exactly what we need to do what God is calling us to do. And we can know that he has brought us into his grace by his work on the cross. And we can trust it and rely on it, stand on it so confidently that we can also be free from the false counterfeit sources of strength, empty empowerments uh, that we so often want to tap into, enablers that don't really last. Let me give you a few examples of that. I was once on a mission trip in another country, um, very low income area and a, and a local pastor, not on our team, but from this, from this city, rolls up to our site in a, in, in a shiny new, oddly clean truck uh, into a, the, the dirt fields where migrant workers live and have nothing, where they just scrap their homes together out of tarps and pallets. This pastor steps out with obviously colored hair uh, with nice, big, chromy looking watch. Wants to make sure everybody can see that he, he's got a nice cell phone. He's loud and flamboyant. And I don't feel the least bit guilty for calling this guy out right now uh, because those are counterfeit cosmetic strengths that he was flaunting in a place that needed none of that. They just needed God's grace and compassion and care right there. And he was using these materials these things to feel a sense of superiority or prominence. We later found out that our, our kind of suspicions, our sense about this guy were, were confirmed when we learned he, he wasn't clean with how he handled his finances, his church's money, the, the missionary support that, would, that was coming in for him. And so I think he was using image and status and, and finance as false strength. We don't need that when we are empowered by God. That's not the thing that's going to help us succeed in ministry. Actually, the opposite for him. I personally, just to confess, don't really want to share this, but I, I found a, a false sense of empowerment in my own heart this week. When somebody made a comment um, about me being new in ministry, I was offended. I wanted to be defensive and corrected, corrective. Uh, but after a quick second, I realized maybe I'm, maybe I'm deriving like a sense of pride from duration, like how long I've been in, like that matters. Assuming my resume or my experiences provide me some kind of strength. And I was quickly convicted that that's super shallow. That's just a flimsy human concept of tenure and credibility and not even close to attached to the gracious work of Jesus. It's just a human thing. So why would I, why would I expect that to be the thing that makes me look or feel strong? I had to release that. I'm confessing it to you. And I'm just saying I need to hear this passage as well. Another idea is that sometimes we hear phrases like, hey, you got this. Just believe in yourself. You know, you can do it. I, I feel like that's it's kind of a misleading motivator pretty often. It's kind of hollow hype because maybe you don't got it. You know, maybe you should not believe in yourself. Just believe in Jesus instead. He's got it. You know what I'm saying? This is, all this is kind of like synthol muscle injections. Have you heard of that? It's like literally oil that, that people, bodybuilders, will like shoot into their muscles to inflate them. It's absolutely false, fake, empty, meaningless image of strength. 
no functional value. It helps you look strong, but it's really more likely to cause damage, to throw off your, your, your balance and physique and everything. It's counterfeit strength. Empty, shallow, meaningless. And so those are just a few examples of empty enablers or empowerments. They, they don't last. They let you down. And so I want to encourage you to please think this week about what yours might be. If there's anything you're trusting for, for a sense, image of strength, let the Lord point that out. Let him free you from it, release you, so that you can instead be strengthened and empowered by something that's real and effective and sustaining the grace that's in Jesus Christ. Those are just some of the ways that the, the grace of God enables us to follow Jesus. And more specifically for Timothy, as Paul was writing to this young man, Paul, Paul says to him, let God's grace be the thing that enables you to build and advance the church by passing along the elder role, the pastor role, commissioning leaders to keep the word of God moving forward so that more and more people can be saved. That's his specific charge to Timothy. Look at that in verse 2 with me. Verse 2 says, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. A little bit of background on Timothy. He's this longtime co-missionary with the Apostle Paul, a trusted, respected, loved younger church leader in Ephesus, which is modern Turkey. Uh, he's been trained up by Paul in the gospel, among other leaders, many witnesses, missionaries, pastors, uh, that whole team. And like the previous chapter, last week's message said, Timothy is supposed to guard the deposit that was given to him, this teaching that, his, that he has received, and then con continue the pattern of stewarding that precious treasure of the good news of Jesus by carefully handing it off to faithful, competent brothers in Christ, just as it was to him. It says, give this gospel ministry to trustworthy men who will be, future verb, will be capable once you equip them to handle the word with integrity, with character, with accuracy, with diligence. Why such a specific instruction and why make such a big deal out of his need for strength? Because this is hard work, especially this time, this environment. This is a hostile place and season. You could be persecuted and hated and imprisoned, like Paul was actually, killed for your faith in Jesus. And in a city, Ephesus, or if you read Acts 19, that's some of the background on Ephesus, they rioted in rage, dragged the missionaries out to the, to the center of the city because they, they realized that Jesus and all those ideas about the gospel threatened their demonic idol worship system. They were not happy about that. This is not a friendly space. And so to identify and develop these pastor, elder type guys who can endure under that pressure in that place, that's, that's a daunting endeavor. And absolutely dependent on the empowering grace of Jesus. And so Paul details that out and uses three illustrations to make that point and help encourage Timothy through that struggle. That's verses three to seven. Look at that with me on the screen. Verse three, he says, share in sufferings, as a good soldier of Christ Jesus, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It's the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. So here are three illustrations of careers that involve real struggle, perseverance, hard work, and suffering. And each of these three examples represent a virtue that we need to adopt as Christians. There's a lesson for us in this. A soldier has a single-minded focus on pleasing Jesus. The athlete trains and competes and runs by the rule of righteousness. And the farmer is willing to wake up early, sweat, plow, plant, pick, work hard for a reward. Let's talk through each of those. Soldier first. It's hard to be a soldier. Physically, they had to carry a ton of gear. So there's a literal physical burden on them, but also a tremendous mental, emotional burden. People who have seen combat and been close to death understand what's going on in the military, political realm around the world. Kind of get rewired. You got to think differently. Your focus changes and is on something very specific. And that's Paul's point. 
that for the Christian, we have to remain focused and fixed on Jesus, our enlister, our commander, the one we aim to please. And if we shift that focus away from him to chase other priorities and values, we become entangled in everyday life practicalities, normal activities, uh, TV shows and doctor's appointments and bills and pets and moving to a better neighborhood and getting the next car and politics and paychecks and all that stuff. Not necessarily sinful or evil, uh, but certainly not what should drive us at the core, right? And so this, just to clarify, this soldier image is not saying that we have to cut all that away and be secluded hermits in the desert. It's not saying that Christians shouldn't have normal jobs, you should, or do regular life things. It's not saying you only can eat, live, eat, sleep, church 24-7. It's, it's not saying that you've got to join all the groups and do all the serving things and always be here. What it is doing is illustrating the idea that if you're a Christian, your driving value, your core focus is to help people to follow Jesus. It's saying that he is our ultimate, exclusive, undistractable, permanent, controlling allegiance above everything we do and in everything we do. So do those regular life things, it's fine, but in them, aim to please the Lord. Stay focused on that. We never set him aside to go play and sin, to, to try out other religions, or I just want to focus on my finance right now. I don't, need, I don't need faith in this season of my life. We never do that. Stay focused and faithful to Jesus. So whatever our career, our calling, our commitments, be single-mindedly devoted to honoring Christ above it and through it. Be in it, but don't get entangled by it. Make sense? I hate getting stuck with spider webs all over me. You ever walk out to your car in the morning and you get attacked by those sticky little invisible strands that I, I can't see them before I walk into them. I still can't see them when I'm trying to like pick a, look in the mirror and pick them out of my hair. It's so frustrating. And you know, when you're fighting to get them off, I'm, I'm wondering too, did the spider come with it? Is there something crawling down my shirt right now? You know, it's, it's a whole thing. It doesn't just distract you in that moment. But when I'm driving out of the, pulling out of the driveway, I'm still wondering like, is there... Is it on me? You know, you you feel all that. I hate it. And I hope that we are not allowing the normal everyday business of life to do that to us, to entangle us and stick to us. Let us blindly walk into it. And then all of a sudden it's bringing these other toxic, harmful things with it that can bite us. So if you feel stuck in something that's competing for your attention to Jesus, pulling you away from pleasing the Lord, I want to encourage you to Ask the Lord to help you think about what that might be for you right now. And then let the grace of Christ be the thing that cuts it away so that you can be faithfully focused on him and endure for the advancement of his gospel. This is what soldiers do. Soldiers stay focused and faithful, not stuck in the everyday stuff of life. How about an athlete? What's that about? Over 2,000 years ago, Olympians had to swear an oath to Zeus to train diligently, intensely, strictly for 10 months before the competition. And of course, the regulations and the conduct prescribed in the games had to be followed, and both of these elements comprised the idea of competing lawfully or by the rules, as Paul says in verse 5. And for the Christians, the rules are to train in righteousness. We swear an oath to the one true God, not to Zeus, of course, but in covenantal commitment to Jesus, we are faithful in our preparation and in our perseverance all the way to the finish line. That's what this is illustrating for us. You ever been around an athlete who's actually training for the Olympics, like in real life? Everything is organized by their goal. The whole life is oriented around it. They wake up early to run and stretch and massage and ice, and they make very specific nutritional decisions. They have a doctor checking their supplements to make sure that, you know, I'm not breaking any rules and just so focused on getting to that finish line the right way. The image of standing at the podium, medal around their neck, the monetary reward that comes with that, winning, all of that organizes all of how they live. That's the athlete image. That's our walk with Christ. The athlete runs by the rules, faithful to the finish. The soldier stays focused and doesn't get entangled. And then lastly, the farmer. The farmer. Farming is not easy. It is a it is grueling work. Frustrating, can be low yield, very volatile, vulnerable to bugs and weather and fire. 
drought, critters that come in and eat stuff. And to make it work, you've got to rise and grind. You have to go really hard to farm. Genesis 3 says, theologically, the ground is cursed because of our sin. And so we're going to have to compete with thorns and thistles to pull fruit up out of it. We're going to have to sweat. Our brow is going to be sweaty when we're trying to lift things out of the soil. It's hard. This is documentary called... Uh, the Biggest Little Farm. I don't know if you've seen that. I thought it was really helpful in understanding the grind that farming can be. It's a great picture for how ministry and how Christian life can go sometimes too. So many pictures in parallel. So check that out. Um, shows the unbelievable struggle. But there's a great reward at the end of all that. A fruit harvest. Very satisfying result. And that's life with Jesus when he returns. The farmer is willing to work hard for that. Like the soldier and the athlete, farming is everything. It's your whole life. And as the soldier depicts who we endure for, that's Jesus, the athlete illustrates how we endure in righteousness, right? The farmer shows why we endure, the prize of life with the Lord. This is the Christian walk. This is ministry. This is Paul's charge to Timothy. And it's all about being empowered by the grace of God to endure for the gospel. That's the first half of this passage. And in the second part, we're going to hear Paul instructing Timothy personally, theologically, and missionally to say, stay faithful to God for the salvation of the saints. Stay faithful to God for the salvation of the saints. He's going to share from his own experience of faithful suffering and enduring for the gospel. He's going to remind Timothy what the mission of the church is. And he anchors all this to the faithful, consistent character of God. Those three things. So let's look for those in verses 8 to 13. Verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as I preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Verse 11. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Looking back to verse 8 to 10, I think Paul is drawing from what he wrote in Romans 1, if you want to do more Bible study later, Romans 1. He wrote that about a decade earlier. And both those passages, Romans 1 and 2 Timothy, have the same elements of Davidic lineage, David's line, and resurrection. And both of those things are the core of the gospel. Absolutely beautiful consolidations of the good news of Christ. This is exactly the thing that we need to remember, understand as faithful followers of Jesus. This is the thing that we need to te teach and pass along to others, that Jesus is the risen king. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Let me explain why we're saying that about this passage. We say king because Jesus is the offspring of David, and David was the king of Israel, with whom God made a covenantal promise in 2 Samuel 7, saying, basically, when you die, David, I will raise up your offspring, and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father. He will be to me a son. And so this is, Jesus is the lineage of David. Culminated. He is the eternal king. He is the son of God. He is the Messiah, the Christ. The fulfillment of God's promise. And this is so cool. If he's the fulfillment of that promise... So is he the fulfillment of God's promise to Eve way back in Genesis 3 that her offspring would be raised up to crush the head of the serpent. He's the fulfillment of God's promise to Noah in Genesis 9 that he would not destroy the world by flood again, but that he would bring final justice through Jesus, the perfect righteous judge, the lamb standing although slain, the only one worthy to open and carry out the scroll of God's judgment in Revelation 5. 
He's the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12 to 22 to make his offspring a blessing to all the nations of the earth. That's Jesus. He's the fulfillment of the promise to Israel in Deuteronomy to raise up a prophet like Moses that would mediate this new covenant with God's people who would speak for the Lord. He's the fulfillment of the promise in Jeremiah to raise up a righteous branch that would reign as king in wisdom and in justice. He's the fulfillment of messianic prophecy in Micah and Isaiah, the fulfillment of Daniel 7, and that vision where the Son of Man, Jesus, comes in on the clouds of heaven and appears before God the Father, the Ancient of Days, to receive an everlasting dominion and glory and kingdom that will never be destroyed, that all people and nations and languages would serve him. This is King Jesus who came to earth to live in the flesh like you and me, to live perfectly in every way that you and I failed to die in our place for the sin that we've committed, our unfaithfulness to God, paying the penalty that we deserve to pay so that we could be forgiven and set free from sin's grip. This is Jesus who was raised back to life in power and in glory so that we too could be restored and renewed, brought into his strength and in grace forever. This is Jesus. This is the gospel. This is who we preach. This is his message This is the word that is not bound and never will be. Amen? Amen. This is why Paul was willing to wear chains and suffer as a criminal. This is why we're okay with struggling today. This is why who we endure for. This is who we are faithful to. Our promised, risen King Jesus that he might be glorified he might be honored and pleased so that his elect, his chosen, all who will be saved, all who embrace him in faith might come to salvation in him. And so I hope we're seeing in all of this that we endure for that gospel. We remain faithful to that God for the salvation of his saints. One, because of the example of other believers who have suffered before us, given their lives so that the message of Jesus might go forward. Two, because of the mission of his church. It's our call to help people to discover grace and forgiveness and life in Christ, missional. And then third, theologically, because of who God is. Because he is faithful, which is what the whole last section of this passage is gonna say and sing. In this creedal hymn, this theological poem that conveys the consistency of God's character in a way that enables us to endure and to stay faithful to the faithful one. But before we do that, can you try something with me? A little bit of an emotional shift, sorry. I'm into gum right now for a few reasons. Uh, when I'm talking to you in the lobby, like I had this chimichurri, it was really good on my steak last night. I don't want you to have to deal with that. You know what I mean? I had coffee just now before the service. I don't want you to have to smell that on my breath when I'm talking to you. I need gum for that, you know? So I'm relying on gum these days. Also, like when I'm, I get a little hungry, but I'm, I don't want to quite eat yet, gum can kind of curb that appetite. So it's important that the gum I chew lasts. I need it to endure through those situations. I'm not sure what this reveals about me, but I'm kind of feeling like fruit and bubble gum type flavors these days. You could judge me, I don't care, it's fine. Uh, but I've been trying different brands that make that, those kinds of flavors and recently came across these. Uh, this, was, this one's a mouthful. Icebreaker cherry limeade cubes and then watermelon flavor from Extra, okay? And I honestly do think that both of these taste really good. I'm not gonna make you try something gross. Uh, but one of them lasts and the other one doesn't. One of them I can count on, and the other one just lets me down. So I want to invite you to test these with me. I need two volunteers with some strong taste buds. You've got to understand flavor, you know what I mean? And then also a good critical opinion. Who's, who's got that? Anybody want to try this with me? You want to, yes. Which one do you want? First hand up, you get to pick. Extra. You want extra? Can I throw it to you? Yeah. Okay. You're welcome to share that with maybe, you know, two, three, four people around you. They're individually wrapped, okay? So we're all clean here. These are not individually wrapped, so this is like family pack. Keep it close. You don't want hands in there. I'm gonna give you some napkins because 
when you start singing, we don't want gum flying around the room. You know what I mean? Who wants to try this one? Yeah. I'm going to go, I'm going to go you back there. Can I throw it that far? I'm going to hit somebody though. Come out a little bit for me. Come out a little bit for me. You can, you can come up here. Yeah, I'm going to leave this for you right here. Ooh, there you go. Share that with your family. Okay. So go ahead and throw a few pieces in. Start working on it. Wrapper crinkle is okay. Nobody's, nobody's judging you for that. Start chewing that stuff, and then I'm going to check back in with you in a couple minutes, okay? All right. While they're doing that, let's go back to verse 11. <laughs> Great transitions today. And I want us to look at another reason to endure, to last, to remain faithful. Remember that we've seen personal reasons. We've seen missional reasons, and now we're going to see theological reasons to stay committed to Christ. 11b, let's look at this together on the screen. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. This feels like an echo of Romans 6 to 8. Again, if you want to do some more Bible study, check that out. And it also sounds like the words of Jesus in Matthew 10, 33. And even though when we read that passage... I, I don't know about you, but it, it doesn't immediately get me pumped up. You know, it doesn't feel like a, like a hype text to me. But it I guarantee you, it certainly would have been reassuring and strengthening for Timothy, the young guy, church leader that Paul was writing to. Here's why. Because in verse 11, that refers to the fact that we believers who have abandoned our former lives, died to ourselves, and been crucified with Christ... We are now dead to our sin, and sin is no longer operative or dominant over us. And so we are internally, spiritually, fully restored. A new creation, 2 Corinthians 5 says. And one day, we will be physically resurrected. We will not be aching and decaying anymore. We'll be fully restored to live with Jesus forever in perfection. That is beautiful. That is encouraging. That is full of hope for anyone who is struggling, especially physically. That won't be forever. That's verse 11. Verse 12 says that if we endure, if we last, if we persevere, then, this is so cool, when Jesus comes back and establishes his literal physical kingdom and rule on earth, we get to rule with him. Revelation 20 talks about this. A ton of other places in the Bible actually talk about this too. Matthew 19, 20, 25, Galatians 4, James 2. It's all over the place. Talk about how we get to have a role of authority under Jesus' ultimate authority and rule. We get to reign and judge and administrate with him. And I think that's so amazingly generous of God. We, we started out as enemies of his kingdom, fighting God, saying, no, I reject you. And God in love and grace had brought us in with his love. He clothed us in his royalty in a way that we would never deserve. And now we get to sit with King Jesus when he comes back to bring peace, to bring goodness, to end political corruption, to install the best government that we've ever seen, leadership that we can absolutely, unquestionably, truly trust. Where Jesus is in charge of the economy, literally paving the roads, caring for the environment, bringing legislation and judgment that are gonna actually keep the world in check. And we get to be a part of that if we endure. Can you believe that? That's in the Bible. If we don't last, though, if we deny him, if we become ashamed of Jesus, abandon our faith, buckle under social, political pressure, cave into persecution for the sake of comfort, then we are denying Christ. We are taking the crown and putting it on something else on political alignment, on social acceptance, on safety, on an easier life, and saying, I would rather have this be king. I reject you, Jesus. If we do that, he will also deny us. That's not mean of him. It's just fair, giving us what we wanted. It's more motivation for us to keep following him faithfully, to last and to endure. All right, gum check. Which one had extra? Your extra, your icebreaker? 
icebreaker crew, um, what percentage is the flavor at now compared to when you started? Five. Whoa, 5%. Okay, I went quick. Extra people, what would you say, percentage? 60, 70, good. Yeah, yeah, I would, I'd say 80. Somebody previous service said 95. Pretty high, it's not bad. It's not dying off, right? Good, okay. Icebreaker, sorry. Tastes great at first, but it quits on you, right? Real quick. If the color gray was a flavor, that's what's in your mouth right now, huh? It's not great. You keep working on that, it's gonna do that thing where gum starts like falling apart and gets all grainy and just like, ugh, get this out of it, you know? Terrible, I hate that. Never going to buy that again. Sorry if you work for icebreakers. I'm not trying to take shots at your company. It just doesn't work. The letdown. Spit it out. But extra, extra endures, doesn't it? it man, it's dependable. Can we be a little more extra? I love that word right now. I know what it means. It's dramatic and over the top and you're trying too hard and settle down. That's extra. But let's be capital E extra people who last, who endure, who keep going, who stay faithful, who don't just get initially excited about Jesus and quickly fade and lose our flavor, our interest in him, but persevere and keep going so that many might be saved. Yeah? Let's be extra people. Not only should this extra thing, this gum, this passage, this idea prompt us to last, it should remind us that we need to be praying for other people who are in a position where they need to last and endure as well, right? There are Christians who are in environments that are very high pressure, where they are persecuted by the government, their life, their family, their well-being, their church are actually truly threatened. They have to worship in fear. That is so hard. So let's stand with them. Let's pray for them. Put them on your prayer list this week. Stand with them in prayer that they would endure and be faithful and keep going in Christ. Also, this feels a little weird to say this, but I want to invite us, encourage us to pray for the pastors and the preachers, the musicians, the high-profile Christians, influencers who may have already denied Christ, who who are on the edge of muddying up the clarity of the gospel, teaching things that are more popular, less Christian. Let's pray that they would come back and be faithful and endure and last, that they would be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus to honor him and serve him as king alone and nothing else. Let's pray for both. One more Reason, one more verse, we can be encouraged to do this, to endure, to keep going. Verse 13 says, we don't serve a moving target. God is not teasing us with some game where the finish line or the rules keep changing. But he is faithful to himself and to his plan to redeem the world through the work of Christ. To save all who would believe in him and give them everlasting life. That's it. That's the answer. He is faithful to that. And even though people do reject Jesus, spiritually cheat on God, turn away from him in their unfaithfulness, he is still faithful himself. He is sticking to his redemptive plan. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He is steady. He is sure. He does not self-contradict. He does what he says he will do. And so until Jesus comes back, God's grace stays on the table for you to accept. Eternal salvation remains the finish line for we who put our faith in Jesus and keep it there. And so because he is faithful, Christians, let's be empowered by grace to endure for the gospel. And let's stay faithful to God for the salvation of the saints. Here's the second thing I told you that I would share about myself, also embarrassing. My cardio is really bad right now. Um, I could barely finish a mile without like taking a break. It's pretty pathetic. My running endurance is not great. I feel like I need to find a new kind of empowerment and strength and discipline so that I'm not running out of breath. I don't have to quit, but I can keep going when I need to. Like 
honestly, I think about this, I don't know how many, I think this is like a guy thing, but what if a bear is chasing me? Like, I got to get out of that. I couldn't right now. That's a problem. I need a new type of endurance. I need to work on that. Maybe that's where you're at spiritually, feeling winded, tired, ready to give up. I wonder if that's because we need to disconnect from disappointing sources of strength that aren't helping us to last in the long run. Empty energy that does not endure. We need to spit out that gum. And instead, rediscover the grace that is in Christ Jesus in all the ways that we need to be strengthened for serving, for evangelism, for pain, for political pressure. We need to let Jesus and his grace be the thing that cuts away those entanglements that compete with our commitment to him and hear his call to focus on him above and in all that we do. And we need to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ and for those who are on the edge of unfaithfulness. And maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you're not sure, teetering a bit. Friend, I want you to know God wants you back. Come back. He loves you. He wants you to stay. Know that his compassion does not fail. Know that his mercy is new for you every morning. Know that he offers you forgiveness and peace, strength and hope. Know that he is faithful forever. Because of that, we can be empowered by grace to endure for the gospel and stay faithful to God for the salvation of his saints. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your empowering strength that you extend to us, that you pour into us, that you invite us into through the saving work of Jesus Christ and through your precious gift of the Holy Spirit who is at work in our lives. God, would you please help us to trust that more, to rely on that, to stand in that, nothing else, to seek you for strength. Lord, I wanna pray this over all who are feeling weak and winded right now. I pray this for all who are feeling tempted and pressured. May we look to you for the power to persevere and to stay faithful to you, God. Faithful to the truth of the gospel. Faithful to your mission to move in the church to save the lost. We need the grace and the strength that come from you. We thank you. We praise you, Lord, for your faithfulness to us. We sing that now in the name of Jesus. Amen.